Hello, Judge Horvick and a whole lot of other people in here. Aloha. Aloha. Are you in fact uh, zooming in from Hawaii? I, I am in fact zooming in from Hawaii. And uh, we should all come to your house. Is that what I heard you say? That's, I think I heard you say, I'm accommodating everybody in this room. I think, beach, I think the beach is about four blocks down. We can just go do the round there. That, okay, done, I'm there. Uh, give, me, give me a couple of minutes, just pack me a bathing suit, be there ASAP. Awesome, awesome. I'm actually in California, so it's not as, you know, I know some people in Vermont like literally have snow right now. So you're probably gonna get more takers from there so do we do we know how many judges are coming today apparently we have a third judge are we are we a a, a three panel judge a three, we, would we guess i i would i think so no but my my text literally only had my name and my tab room only has my name so i'm same excited same. and thrilled that i am not the only person sitting in the room because i thought all the pressure was going to be on me uh, it, it, it still could be all on you, but but we're going to try to. <laughs> all right, I see Esmeralda. I see Neely. Let me pull up my participants list. That will be easier. Neely, you're double entered in something. So we either got to get you out or get you uh, in first. Is that what's happening? Uh, if that's fine with the rest of the contestants, that's perfectly fine with me. OK, well, and I see you and Oliver are the two people who are double entered. Uh, uh, Oliver, are, are you, um, ah, excellent. Hello. Um, hi, uh, I'm double entered, but in my other round, I'm going last. So I could just stay until I can just stay in, in order. I can go in order this. and, and do your thing. Neely, what That's are you in round. your other round? I am fifth in my other round. So, I mean, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Okay, well, maybe maybe we'll make sure we get started right at three, and then Neely, you'll go and du and dip, and Oliver, you'll go and dip. Not to be confused with Olivia, uh, who it looks like you're here, but um, are not double entered. And then that is correct. <laughs> excellent. And then Delina, am I saying that correctly? Yep, you said it correctly. Oh, two points for me. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Extra speaker points for me. And Kamora, did I say that correctly or the camera? It's Kamora. Oh, okay, thank you. I win. All right, so I'm going to Hawaii and I pronounce everybody's names right. I, I'm, that's, I, that's the best I'm gonna be all day. All right, excellent. Judges, do you like when they throw their uh, entry things into the um, chat or? Do you care? Do you not care? I love it when it's in chat. It's one less thing. I Either have. way is fine. Excellent. All right. Well, maybe we'll uh, we'll if if you guys have access to chat and can uh, and can throw that in there. It does look like we have everybody here. Am I gonna need tissues? I'm probably gonna need tissues, right? Oh, DI, man, I got, so I had OI and HI. I thought I had like gotten through without a, a DI round. And I was like, wow, gonna be, gonna, gonna not cry. Gonna not cry this tournament, but that's cute. That's apparently not gonna happen. I don't know, OI is here, miss. Sometimes you can cry in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, no, the OIs were good. The HIs were adorable. Like, I was so happy. I texted the 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 um, coach uh, and I was like, I just got like OI and HI. You can sign me up for that anytime. And then, and then, and then it was like, congrats, Scully. You're doing DI, you know, quarters. I was like, no, 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 let's, let's not. Okay, let me literally grab tissues because I'm that, I'm that person. And then maybe if we want to get started a little early, because I think we have everybody here and we got to get Neely and Oliver out of here. So um, hang on, let me just grab tissues, literally.
Awesome Blossom. Why does it say that my two results are pending? I don't know. I'm right, not worrying about it. Not worrying about it. I think that's just like your comments because you have the ability to comment through the rest of tournament. Got it. All right. I'm so excited that you knew that answer to that question because that was that was I was like I submitted. I really I promise you I submitted like right <laughs> after the round was over too. All right. Um, Esmeralda, are you? Do you say Esmeralda or Esmer es Esmeralda? Esmeralda. Whatever you can pronounce is perfectly fine with me. I, I have any hard feelings. <laughs> that is very adorable. I'm Gabriella and I'm Gabby with one B and a Y. And so I get very like neurotic about people misspelling my name, especially when it's usually like in my, you know, profile or whatever. And I'm like, no, no, really, no, seriously. Like if it's there, just yeah. do it right. If it helps, as me. That's what as I me. I give one up. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself. Um, and I don't mean to, to talk so much, although it's kind of an occupational hazard as a teacher. Um, so if either of the other judges has anything what they want to say, otherwise, um, I think just, you know, if everybody is ready, we'll all thumbs up and then we'll hit our timers on our stuff and you'll just start speaking and then we'll clap and cry and then, and then we'll go on. That's fine. If any of you guys want time signals, just ask before your piece. I'm timing myself so I won't be needing any, but a quick sorry in advance, it's a full house today. <laughs> so you might hear a little background noise, but if y'all are ready to go, if you can hear and see me all right. We can, and you should not at all worry. None of none of the uh, participants should worry in the slightest about, we we are fully aware of that. <laughs> Zoom, is a, Zoom is a thing that, that one cannot control one's background or the other people in the world, so. All right, best of luck to everybody. De ilusión también se vive. De ilusión también se vive. You know, I'll never forget those words. Every day of my life, when I look at myself in the mirror, I hear my mother say, De ilusión también se vive. Of hope also one lives. A Mexican proverb. This one means think a little bigger. Life isn't always about the finish line. It's about the dream of it all. When you're an immigrant, these dreams are what you live for. You never know if they'll come true or not, and honestly, I never cared, but just living for these dreams made life. It made everything what it needed to be after my accident. No. No, it wasn't an accident. It was an attack. According to the national census projection, by the year 2050, the number of Latina women to experience sexual assault could reach up to 10.8 million. This is a real problem that many of my Latina sisters are experiencing. And as a young Latina myself, I feel like it's my obligation to speak up for those who are still too afraid to speak for themselves. With that being said, Trigger warning, this election contains graphic material on sexual assault and harassment. Hopes and Dreams by Christy Thomas. My parents growing up were very protective. I was the kind of kid that had to be home before the street lights came on. But the one thing that my parents did that I fully supported was choosing to raise us in a neighborhood where we were surrounded by people that looked like us. These people, they understood the feeling that came with being an immigrant in America. Even though we were Mexican American, that's not what mattered to my parents. What mattered was how other people saw us. The looks that we got when we spoke Spanish to each other in recent America has only made their nerves that much worse. 
but they were always on alert, even when they shouldn't be. I was the oldest out of four, which meant my only job in life was to make my parents' lives easier, and I took it very seriously. <laughs> I wanted to become a doctor, but in reality, I would have done anything to make my parents proud. So when decision day came around and it was time to decide on a university, I decided to leave the state. And on top of that, I decided to attend one of the largest universities in the country because they gave me a full scholarship. <laughs> it took months to convince my parents into giving me their blessing to leave the state. I promised I would call them every day and they would have everything they needed to know to keep tabs on me. In case you didn't already know, I wasn't going to college to party or have fun. I was going to college to study and to turn my dreams into a reality. You know, when I was younger, my mother would talk about dreams in a way that made them sound so, um, angelic. <laughs> But this dream, well, this dream was everything but angelic. This dream started off like any other Saturday night. The dorm was really loud, but I had my headphones on listening to Selena Siunaes. I was in my zone. The girls were going out to some party and like always they invited me. I said, you girls look. Uh, great. And I really appreciate the invite, but I have to stay home and study. But if you need anything, call me and I'll be there. That was my job. I was the designated walker. My parents taught me many ways to stay safe on campus. We live in a world where we're surrounded by people that aren't always nice and your first mistake is one. No, no, it was, it was my mistake. My mistake was when I thought that those people w weren't surrounding me because they were. Look, I know that I'm Mexican, okay? I didn't need anyone to remind me that rape culture and racism is alive and well, and I needed to grab my purse because that's where my mace was. It was around one o'clock when I, I got a call that Lacey had gotten trashed again. So I grabbed my phone and my keys and it wasn't until I was halfway through the parking lot where I, I realized that I didn't have my purse. So I stood there looking at the dorm and looking at the party down the street and it's only a couple of blocks. What could happen? So I started walking and when you're walking alone at night, everything from the wind blowing to a squirrel running across your feet is terrifying. I saw a group of men in the distance. So I turned on an alley that I took every day to my 8 a.m. class and I heard a sound. It was nothing. And then I heard the bottle break and and they were surrounding me and they were saying things like, look, what we have here, another damn illegal. She's here on a scholarship that we didn't get cause we're white, but there's something real nice about caramel skin. I wonder if her tacos taste as good as the ones at the frat house. Me taco, Sue taco. <laughs> I tried to run and they grabbed me by my hair and they pulled me behind the dumpster and they beat me. No! No! No, stop, please, no! Oh. 
I played dead. I, I figured maybe if they couldn't see that I was breathing, that they would just leave me alone. <laughs> but I, I could feel the blood <laughs> falling out of my mouth. <laughs> and my teeth falling onto my tongue. <laughs> and then I felt my jacket come off and I said, please. <laughs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> It can't happen this way. <laughs> but they didn't stop. <laughs> they took every innocent part of me that night. And for years, I asked myself why. Why did it have to be me? Why didn't I go back to that stupid dorm and get my stupid purse? Why did it have to be me? But I know why it was me. They picked me because I'm Mexican. I survived a hate crime. I am a survivor of sexual assault. And I now help other survivors and remind them that the illusion también se vive. Life isn't always about the finish line. It's about the dream of it all. Thank you so much, Esme. I always feel very challenged about clapping after something like that, but thank you very much. Neely, let's get you started so that you can get out. What are you double entered in? I am about to do round six of OI. Okay, so put on your sadness hat and then good luck to you in your not in your interpretation hat. Excellent. Jesse was born June 30th, 2006. Weighing in at a, a whopping 11 pounds and with an ear jarring set of lungs too. Right from the get go, Jesse was always in a rush to tackle life. <laughs> he was definitely a mama's boy who could never cuddle enough, but he was also this rambunctious, fearless kid who all oh, boy. You know, my favorite times with Jesse were in the mornings. First, I would, I would wake him with a song. I woke up this morning with an angel in my bed. He must have been trying to rest his precious head. He said, could I borrow you for something precious to eat? And I said, yes, angels love something sweet corners of his cheeks, they would curl into a smile. <laughs> and then I would kiss his cheeks and start tickling him. <laughs> a minute later, he would be fully awake and ready to rumble, as he'd say. <laughs> Let's wrestle, Mom. It was perfection. And I I never wanted it to end. March 21st, 
2005, Redland. February 14th, 2018, Parkland. December 14th, 2012, Sandy Hook. Sound familiar? When it comes to school shootings, we typically say tragic and then we move on with our lives. But for the families of the 27 victims at the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, life will never be the same. One mother in particular seeks to find peace and the ability to forgive in her book, Nurturing Healing Love by Scarlett Lewis. That last morning with Jesse began like so many others did. Jesse's father came to pick him up for school that morning. It was a bright, beautiful, sunny day, but so cold the night before that my car was actually covered in a layer of frost. So I bundled Jesse up and he headed outside. When I went to follow him to give him a kiss goodbye, I saw he had an ear to ear grin on his face. Oh. He had written me a note on the passenger side window of my car in the frost and it said, I love, okay, love you, mommy. I love you, mom. Little did I know that would be his final goodbye to me. The next event that I, I can remember is I was sitting at my desk at work when my colleague sent me an instant message. Did you hear about the shooting in Newton? I, I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I mean, this is Sandy Hook. What could happen? And then a moment, every single electronic device around me began ringing, beeping, buzzing, delivering a barrage of phone calls and emails. It was too much for my brain to assemble, but then it seemed too clear. There had definitely been a shooting and it had definitely happened at Jesse's school. I kept telling myself, he's okay, he's okay, nothing's gonna happen to your boy. And when I got to Sandy Hook Elementary School, I was greeted by mass confusion. Excuse me, have, have you seen my son? Jesse, yes, he's, he's this tall. No, 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 yes, Jesse, my son, he's, has anybody seen my son? Nobody had. A state trooper shouted, we're sweeping and sweeping the school. Some of your children went to hide and we're currently searching every corner and crevice and I, kept saying, he's okay, he's okay, Scarlett, he's gonna be okay. And I just, I held my breath and I hoped, Jesse. That's when the screaming started. A mother on the opposite side of the room from me let out a cry that just broke my heart into expressing a loss that words can never define. Oh, but I kept saying, he's okay, and he's coming. And I, I didn't know what to do, so I just, I held my grandmother's silver cross necklace and I drew on my faith for support. That's when an elderly doctor walked straight towards me in the crowd. There is no easy way to tell you. Your son, Jesse, is dead. No, for a few desperate seconds, my mind clutched at home. That doctor didn't show me a body. Nobody showed me a body. I thought, you don't know my son. No, no, he, he's so smart. He's just, he's hiding in the woods somewhere. But he wasn't. I wasn't surprised uh, to learn later that when the first blasts of gunfire echoed through the halls of Sandy Hook Elementary School, Jesse did not run. And when Ms. Soto, the first grade teacher that Jesse loved so dearly, tried to hide the children in the bathroom, Jesse remained by her side. Jesse stayed by his teacher even when the gunman entered the classroom and he opened fire. And it was then he did what I am now certain that he was put on this earth to do. He saved lives. 
when the gunman paused for a moment to reload his gun or to fix it, Jesse yelled to his classmates that this was their chance to escape. And he told them to run, to run as fast as they could. And they did. Nine terrified first graders managed to run to safety at the gunman. He took aim at Jesse. And then he my six-year-old son in the forehead. And then he finished what he'd come to do to kill as many innocent people in the school as he could. And he killed, he killed 27 in all. And when the first responders arrived on the scene, they found Jesse's lifeless body on the floor next to the body of Miss Soto. that I experienced every morning when I woke up was excruciating. I thought, God, how am I supposed to get through this? And how am I supposed to keep something like this from ever happening again? Because I have no idea. But Jesse did. At that moment, I glanced over at a chalkboard Jesse and I had set up years ago in, in his really messy handwriting. He said, nurturing, healing, love. Nurturing, healing, love. Three words. Big enough to change the world. It's beautiful here now. You know, I always bring Jesse a gift when I come to see him from the collection of toys sent to us from people who reached out from all over the world. And I know how Jesse loved to share, so I often bring the children we lost that day a gift as well. But I haven't really lost Jesse, though. He's with me wherever I go because love. Love never ends. I woke up this morning with an angel in my bed. Thank you, Neely. We wish you the best in OI, and we understand completely. We think you should uh, dip out of here to. Uh, Luck in both of your uh, in both of your rooms. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, Oliver. I'm going to guess that you don't say. Maybe it's Lasco. I'm I'm going to pretend yeah. like I know how to pronounce your last name. Perfectly. Really? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay. This day should go down in recorded history. April 18th, 2021. I got everybody's names right. Um, Oliver, let's get you in and out of here so that you can go and um, compete in, I have forgotten now what you were double entered in. Oh, humorous interpretation. H-I, oh good. So you make everybody cry and then you can make everybody laugh. Wonderful. Perfectly balanced. And perfectly balanced, excellent. Um, let me see, ah, there you are. Okay, perfect. Um, whenever you are ready, I am ready. I am assuming both other judges are okay. Perfect, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Shadow face rah, versus corn rocket man. Corn rocket man is victorious. You hear that? You're at it. Mom and Harold. The real shadow face. Yep. There. 
puffed up, going at it, like a couple of rabbits. Like on that battery commercial, the one that never stops. Boom, 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 boom. They get hopped up a lot. Anyway, Miss Wong, the guidance counselor of school says that I have a prodigious memory. I have to look it up. Prodigious, enormous or extraordinary in size. Miss Wong says that my prodigious memory will come in handy one day when I'm an astronaut or a geologist. That's what I told her I knew it was gonna be. And she said, oh, a geologist? Just think of all those walks. Minerals, actually. Petrologists do rocks. And that's when I told her of my dream of going to the Grand Canyon. You have to ignore them. Eventually they get tired and fall asleep. Eventually. The American Addiction Center estimates that one in eight children living in the United States, 8.7 million live with at least one parent afflicted with substance abuse. The problem has become so pervasive that even Sesame Street has a character, Carly, who opens up to Elmo about her feelings of shame, embarrassment, and loneliness due to her mother's dependency, something that a lot of children with addicted parents go through, like Christopher, who is both acutely aware of his parents' addiction while simultaneously naive to the long-standing effects it will have on his own life, sharing his story and removing the stigma of substance abuse is important because it allows us to reveal our own dark addictive secrets before it's too late. Corn Rockets by Todd Huron. We never went on vacation. I mean, we did what everyone else did. Trips to the mall, Sundays at Lake Michigan, but Never technically vacation. So it was ultimate the summer I turned 10 and mom said we were going on a road trip. The three of us to the Grand Canyon. I remember it was long, really long and really hot. Middle of July. I sat in the backpack of the station wagon with all my stuff. I read a lot, drew a lot watching the wires on the side of the highway dip and rise, dip and rise. It was pretty monotonous. Harold drove three days and nights, nonstop. I think he must have been hopped up. I asked him, Harold, why can't we stay at a campground like real vacation families? And he said that the station wagon was like a moving campground. A moving campground. That's strange. Right, mom? Isn't that strange? Oh. He's hopped up too. In the morning, we stopped for a pee break in this place called Jupiter, Nebraska. I wanted to get a postcard to send back to my classmates. Greetings, earthlings from Jupiter, Nebraska corn capital of the universe. And that's when I saw it. The corn rocket. It's a rocket that looks like corn. Basically, you unscrew the bottom and fill it up with water. That's your fuel. Then you insert the pump. It's kind of difficult. You have to create a seal. Then you pump it up and Lift off. 
And the best part is when it hits its apogee, the highest point, an astronaut corn rocket man pops out and floats off on his parachute. It's the most righteous thing. Harold got pretty pissed because every time we launched him, we had to go find him. I said, technically, he was never lost because we always found him. Right, Mom? He took Corn Rocket Man away from me and put him underneath the floorboard with all the maps. That was in Colorado, in a place called Glory Falls. I don't remember seeing any falls. In the morning when we arrived, the sun was rising over the canyon and Mom looked across at Harold and smiled. She said, perfect. That was my thought too. We got out of the station wagon and walked up the hill towards the railing and looked out across the horizon. They were next to me. Our skin was touching. I leaned myself against the railing with my belt buckle and out and out, I was in a bird, I was in a plane, I was super corn rocket Christopher, I was astrogeologist man, I was flying, mom, Harold, look, I... They were gone. I walked back down the hill towards the station wagon. And that's when I heard it. That, that, that sound. I walked up to the station wagon and mom and Harold were in the back, back, hopped up, going and at it all over my stuff. I went to the front seat and my man, my corn rocket man was on the floorboards. I reached in through the window, but it was louder inside. I tried to pull him out, but he had caught on the brake. It was labeled emergency. I tried to pull him out, but it popped. And the station wagon rolled down the hill towards the railing. <laughs> That was our vacation. The three of us at the railing, a family. Above the silent earth, like an astronaut. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, and good luck in a try. I uh, I wish you the best. We're gonna let you dip and uh, and get out of here. And Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely, best of luck, best of luck. And uh, Olivia, it's, it's wonderful to have you. How are you doing today? Excellent. I'm good. Can you see and hear me? Okay. 
Uh, I guess you're close right now. I'm assuming you're going to back up just a little bit and uh, we're going to be able to see your whole face. Uh, and I just, it's apples in winter, yes? Am I back far enough now? Oh, wait, wait, you're, you're so far back, you could come back together. Like you could, you could oh. move back in probably okay. about it five feet. Been... <laughs> I, I can hear you, other judges, are you good hearing? Yep, there you go. All right. Yes, no, you're you're actually back. If you need to come forward, we're happy to have you forward. It was just right when you first started the camera, you were in close. All right. I'd love to say that my mother or grandmother taught me how to prefer Yeah, what's supposed to be? <laughs> If my mother could buy pre-made, she did, whether it was an apple pie or a sandwich. And my grandmother, her idea of dessert was a cigarette and a bourbon. But in my house, we had dessert. The meal just don't feel like it's over without it. Now I tried them all, puddings, cookies, cakes. A pie, pie was the winner. Robert's favorite is pie. Apple pie. My apple pie. I like to think that my pies are more than decent. Maybe it's because they're made with love. Does that sound stupid? It's not. Robert wants a piece of pie. That's it. My son asked for a piece of my apple pie, so I'm going to make him one. There's just something I can give him. Even in here. Dealing with grief is like living two separate lives. One where you pretend like everything is all right, and the other where your heart silently screams in pain. The mothers of death row inmates struggle with anticipatory grief, counting down the last years, months, and days left with their child on this earth. No mother should ever have to know the date of her own child's death. Apples and winter by Jennifer Fawcett. Robert Steele makes money. <laughs> Even now, you know, when they're little, they need you for everything, but once they get older, once they stop asking, they think that they don't need you anymore, but they do. I'm still his mother. To watch your child eight is to watch me something you've made for him. Made with love, that's, it's natural. Natural, that's a tricky word. What we usually mean when we say natural is that it feels right. Just like what feels wrong would be unnatural, but I think that it's more than that. I don't think that it's natural to want to feed your child, but I don't mean every mother feels that way. Man, then. I'm going to let these chill. Don't skip this step. I believe there ain't nothing more natural than a mother and her child. Robert and I are natural. We're fit. We always have been from the moment he was born. I look after my child and in return, he loves me. That's all I need. What feels good feels natural, but is it natural to do what you feel like doing, or is that just following your impulses? Robert followed his impulses, but that wasn't natural. That wasn't him. I mean, that was the drugs. That's the one good thing with him being in here. I mean, he's clean and sober. He's funny and thoughtful and so smart. He was always smart, but for a while it was cloudy. Accuracy is essential with thinking. It's strange to explain it. For me, this is muscle memory. How many times have I done this? One pie blurs into another except the first, of course. 
I remember that one. I mean, my first time having Robert start a kindergarten. Sprinkle some sugar. Every September since then, I've made a pie for him from the apples in our tree. It's been our little ritual. And now, we wait. Day at night, September 28th, 1996. It rained. It rained all night. I went to bed. He left. The phone rang. Robert screaming into the answering machine, Mom, I made you something's happened. He demanded. He begged. I could have answered it. I could have told him to run away and call the ambulance myself. They didn't die right away, those kids. They could have lived. And the boy, he fought back. If he had just given my son what he wanted, I could have told him that. Give him what he wants. You'll take it anyway. Robert was at my house. And then he left in the morning, but I didn't answer it, yelling, screaming into the machine, said he deserved what was his. But he needed me. I could have answered. No, I couldn't. I didn't. I locked the doors. I turned off the lights. He stood outside the house in the rain and I sat in the dark because I wanted it for it to be over because he scares me. Oh, he's sick. Oh, I need to say it. But there's nowhere to sit. There's nowhere to sit. This place is unnatural. I follow my nature. It all feels so good. It was good. I was a good mother, so here with my hair. All I see are the photos from the trial. The boy lying in the parking lot next to the car. The girl in the passenger seat is on over. Louis and Heather, I shouldn't call them the boy and the girl. I made it my business to learn as much as I could about the both of them. It doesn't change anything. I know. But it just seemed important. The girl's father, Heather's father, wrote to me. He wrote, as her father, it was my responsibility to protect my daughter from danger. I failed to do that, and I hate myself for it. But I hate you most of all. Even more than your son. He said, your son is an addict. And I know people call that a disease, but I don't agree. He said, people become addicts because no one cares enough to stop them. And sweetness of cares are pure and simple, and it comes from the home. Your I was a good mother. What do the other families know about my son? Do they know that he used to sing to himself as a boy? Do they know that when he was seven, he won a prize for being able to recite all of his states and capitals? Do they know that he was afraid of storms? I can't do this, I can't. Do this, I can't do this. Has my son ever thought about what these years have cost me? I've lived this sentence with him, and now they, now they know he just need to do this to be a part of this. We're not meant to be parasites. It's not natural to live at the expense of someone else. I told him I was still harvesting your apples, but I'm not. I let them fall to the ground and rocked. He's going to taste that I lied to him. Come. I 
always have a home here. Close your eyes, sweetheart, and know that I'll always stay here. Always. When he backs into this path, he'll know his home. His home is still here. Thank you so much, Olivia. What a piece. What a piece. All right. Del Delina. Yes. And I think I got it before. Uh, I had a little bit like last piece. So if I have any troubles, just make sure to let me know. But can you see and hear me fine? We can see and hear you fine. You 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 dipped out for just a second, but but then you came right back. Um, okay. I think I, what I was saying is that I'm having some Wi-Fi issues, so that checks out. Um, we, uh, I, I can't, I'm going to speak for the other judges, although they should feel free to not let me do that. Um, and just say that we, we're well aware that we're not gonna ding you at all. Look, they're both nodding. Um, we're not gonna ding anybody at all for Wi-Fi issues. And I, and I think unless you have such Wi-Fi issues that it literally, kills the whole feed and you drop out in which case just rejoin the room and we'll you know maybe uh either let you take over back from where you start or we'll have somebody else go and and you know maybe kick everybody else out and and whatever but um we we are we are able to you know pick it up even if it if it dips in and out a little bit and they're both nodding so that sounds like a good plan to me okay First off, uh, I don't tell lies because, uh, well, I, I can't keep up with them. So that's why I have to say this to the world. And, and I want you to hear me loud and clear. Never mind what you think you know about Michael Brown. Now, you might know something, some snippets, some half a moment in time, but you do not know my son's life. And an 18 second video doesn't tell you anything about 18 years. So, before the news media and the nation first heard the name Michael Brown, well, to me, he was just Mike Mike. As we've observed the rise in popularity in the Black Lives Matter movement this past year, is it, important, it is important to understand that the fight against police brutality is not a new one. The countless Black people lost have all had deep ties to the communities from which they were stolen. We must fully realize their humanity and the personal relationships they cultivated in their lifetimes that are now left broken in their absence to begin to understand the impact of police brutality on minority communities. Join a mother through her grieving process after the unjust killing of her son, Michael Brown, and her memoir, To Tell the Truth and Shame the Devil by Leslie McSpaden. From the moment Mike Mike was born, I knew my life had changed forever. You know, I wasn't sure what kind of mother I was going to be, but when I held him in my arms for the first time, he was so beautiful and I never wanted to let him go. You know, mama's sweet baby boy. I mean, I was still shocked that this thing came out of me. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna keep you right here and protect you forever. <sighs> I made a lot of mistakes when I was young, but in raising him, I got stronger and wiser. You know, out of everything that I did, it was him that I did right. He had awards for perfect attendance and, and was even recognized as an outstanding student. He was so proud to show me everything. You know, we hit a little bit of a bump when we had a scuffle with two boys in elementary school. The principal knew I didn't play when it came to my mic mic. And she sat me down. She explained that the boys had gotten into it and, and she had each of them write an essay on nonviolence. My mic mic chose to write about Martin Luther King Jr. And ooh, she wanted to highlight him at the Board of Education. And on that day, I, Mike Mike stood in front of that audience and bravely read his essay out loud. I remember years later when I got a call saying Mike Mike was graduating high school, he just let loose the biggest smile I'd ever seen on his face. 
at that time, there was a confidence that I saw in his eyes that I, I hadn't seen before. You know, as my firstborn, he saw my struggles the most. And I know that motivated him to accomplish the dream I had of finishing school. So on August 9th, uh, 2014, on that day, the deli it's dropped where I'd been working had been jumping since the moment I got there. And I checked the time and I quickly realized it was my break time. So I slipped out of my apron, um, out of the cafe, into my car and just relaxed. Determined to make a few moments of peace matter. But you know, right then I got a cell phone call. And I mean, damn so much for getting a moment to myself, right? Uh, hello? What? What do you mean the police just shot? I hung up and I made my way over there as quickly as I could. And when I got there, the street was thick with people, but I, I fought my way through the big blur of everybody, but was stopped by the chest of this towering police officer. And I look around me and it seemed like the whole damn Ferguson police force had formed this human wall. Please, I, I just need to get to my... And, and then I, I, I caught a glimpse of this, this white bloody cheek laying in the middle of the street and, and I looked again at it. My son's yellow sock was, was pointing out from underneath that sheet and, and his favorite red cardinal's hat was a couple feet away from him. And it hit me. My baby's body was underneath that sheet, motionless. My Mike Mike was dead. And you know, for hours I was going out of my mind begging for information, answers, something. But the cops kept telling me nothing because it was an official police investigation. But how could the police investigate themselves? It made no sense. And just like that, six days had passed since Mike Mike was killed. And even as my community pulled together to support me and my family, Last night's protests made it clear that things were becoming divided in St. Louis. Uh, but I, I, I was behind on reading mail from my lawyers. I went in and I got this big shopping bag filled with mail and started going through each piece. I was reading letters from old people, young people, people from California, Mississippi, even mothers who had lost a son or a daughter. And I was feeling stronger with each word. That was until my hand rested upon this large plain envelope. From Anonymous, Leslie McSpaden, shame is upon you for inciting riots and looting. You failed to teach your son lessons in life. You should pay for the havoc that you've wreaked upon these people. And if you have any bit of conscience, you would repent for the things that you've done. I lost my baby. I mean, who would write something like that? And, and that's why I, I gotta clear things up because folks out here got it twisted. My Mike Mike was a good boy who cared about the right things and his friends and family were at the top of that list. And, and do you know how hard it was for me to get him to stay in school and graduate? You know how many black men graduate here? Not many. 
because you bring them down to this, this type of level where they feel like I don't got nothing to live for anyways. Because they're going to take me out. And they did. And, and you know what? I didn't want anybody doing nothing in Mike Mike's name if it wasn't about getting that cop convicted. God! Every time that my anger begins to build like that, I, I need to stop myself because I know if I look at it for that, at that way for too long, I'll find myself doing something out of character. And I know my Mike Mike would never want me to do anything like that. But you know, people always say they're okay when tragedy happens and some time passes. Well, I'm not. Because the way that you died wasn't. So uh, I'm not gonna say that. But uh, what I do have is really more like a list of wishes. I wish you were still here. <laughs> I wish we had been together. But you know, most of all, I wish the truth had been told, your truth. And I know you're not here to represent yourself, baby, but I will. I love you. And I'm so sorry. Thank you, Delina. Thank you. JDI just kills me. Oh my gosh. All right. You have all been amazing today. I'm sure my fellow judges totally feel that way as well. Um, Kamora, you are our, our last speaker of the day. Thank you so much for your patience. We, we so appreciate it. Hi, can you hear and see me okay? Well, I can. Thank you. Whenever you're ready. Give me two seconds. All right, I am ready. Looks like the other judges are too. Yeah. So the full line was, <clears throat> Oh, say what a what a what? Meow. Me? Gonna ow you. My nails are long, sharp, and ready to slash. Clearly, they were going for the Oscar. <laughs> okay, so the idea for the movie was that a white high school squad the San Diego Toros, got ahead by stealing cheerleader routines from a black team. The East Compton Clovers. And when I got the script for the table read, my character Isis was a combination of Foxy Brown and just about eight other black exploitation characters. Now, I'm not the most ebonically gifted person, but I can recognize a made up word when I see one. And I love campy humor just as much as the next person, but I wasn't trying to be picketed by the NAACP. <laughs> Isis's character wasn't supposed to be some ignorant fool. I wanted Isis to be portrayed as a strong girl who wasn't going to let anyone steal from her. Not without some justice. Former First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama once said, as women, we have to stand up for ourselves, for each other, for justice, for all. As a Black actress, a loving mother and wife, and a fierce activist, 
Gabrielle Union is no stranger to important roles. But through her memoirs, she reminds us that there is always a cost to using our platforms for good. And that only when we are fearless enough to come face to face with the traumas of our past, can we create a better future for us all. We're going to need more wine. By Gabrielle Union. Now, when my husband, Dwayne Wade and I are out together, we get double the attention. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, it's very important to me that I get to portray something so positive for a group of people. But I mean, every interaction is just another opportunity for me to disappoint someone. Again. <laughs> I mean, think about it like this. I'm like a rabbit and I'm just chilling in a field amongst all these other rabbits where a pack of wild dogs live. <laughs> it's like one second I'm just there and then the next second something picks up my scent and I've got to flee. <laughs> like this one night I was at a casino in Las Vegas with my ex-husband Chris and we had gone into an argument so I was crying, like ugly crying. And I was trying to disappear into this incredibly tacky carpet made up of red and green flowers. <laughs> and that's when I could sense it. I was in someone's sights. Bring it on, it's already been brought. A group of white teenage cheerleaders dressed head to toe in full cheerleading regala came up to me while I was still sobbing. <laughs> and I don't know what was worse. The fact that that wasn't even the line <laughs> or that I had to tell them now wasn't a really great time. I remember seeing the disappointment in their faces and just being so fearful that I had disappointed them. I can remember each time I had to tell someone no. You know, one time someone told me, you have this energy around you like something happened that she couldn't control. And it just keeps happening over and over again. Sometimes I'm just frozen in fear. And I feel just like I did that night in Payless. I worked at Payless with all of my friends before my freshman year of college. It was just your typical closing night. I was in the back stacking shoes on the shelves when I heard the doorbell ring. Welcome to Payless, how may I help you? A black man had walked through the door. It was a predominantly white area of town, so I guess we were kind of trained to know when someone who didn't leave the natural stereotype walked through the door. But I was so aware of how the people around me viewed black people. So even though I had this instinct telling me to run, that this was a bad situation, I ignored it. Thank mm -hmm. you.
<laughs> oh, wait. It is like you trapped on this secluded island. And there's no one around you. There is absolutely no one to talk to. With the accessibility of our future, I can't even keep simple boundaries of a fear of disappointing someone. I can't be what some people need me to be. I can't do it. I thought that I would be safe if I somehow managed to get famous enough or successful enough. If I could just pull myself up and move over this mountain of assimilation that everyone in America has just given into. I thought maybe I could escape what happened to me. Maybe there would be a pot of gold or a leprechaun or perhaps even a unicorn at the other end. But there was just another mountain. And then other times we humans just perceive each other, I guess. <laughs> I'll be in the restroom washing my hands next to another woman and she'll take a couple of glances, which I notice, but I just think that she's gonna ask for an autograph or a picture like everyone else. <laughs> but when I turn around to walk away, that's when she'll finally speak up and say, Gabrielle, Me too. We don't hug. We don't <laughs> cry. We're just two women in a moment of mutual respect. And there's this feeling, this really, really amazing feeling that maybe I tell someone. Because I start to feel just a little bit less alone on my secluded island. Thank you. Wow, thank you, everybody. We wish you the best of luck. I don't know if... Uh... Judge, and now I haven't even tried to pronounce either of the judges' names. So, best of, let's see, Brot and Horovic. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And congratulations on quarterfinals of DOC. Ma amazing. Yes, you, all, you all did so good. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Good luck. Bye, guys. <laughs>